Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sterling Gillum, and I'm honored to be the director of your National Naval Aviation Museum. Thank you for being here today, and welcome to Symposium 2019, where our theme this year is the spirit of exploration. Exploration is indeed part of our human spirit, and naval aviation is synonymous with exploration. Be it A.C. Reed's historic crossing of the Atlantic a hundred years ago, starting yesterday, Richard Byrd's trip to the North Pole in 1926, or Gus Shin's historic flight to the South Pole in 1956, naval aviators have been at the forefront of human exploration for the last 108 years. Nowhere is naval aviation more inextricably tied to this spirit of exploration than in the area of space. Since the establishment of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration in 1958, naval aviators have led the way. First American in space, first American to orbit the Earth, four of the Mercury 7 first person to walk on the moon, the last person to walk on the moon. The good news is naval aviation's impact to space exploration continues unabated since Neil Armstrong first walked on the moon 50 years ago this July. We are fortunate to have with us three naval aviators that are perpetuating this spirit of exploration. Seated to my far right is Commander Reed Tonto Wiseman. Tonto is a native of Baltimore, Maryland, a graduate of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute with a degree in computer science and systems engineering. He also holds a master's in systems engineering from Johns Hopkins University and a certificate of space systems from the United States Naval Postgraduate School. Prior to his selection to NASA in 2009, Tonto was an F-14 pilot deploying with the F-31. He is a graduate of the U.S. Navy Test Pilot School, flying a wide variety of naval aircraft. Returning to the fleet after his time in test and evaluation, he deployed with Air Wing 17 and VFA-103. He deployed to the International Space Station in 2014 as part of Exploration 40-41, logging 165 days in space and two spacewalks. Seated to Tonto's left is Marine Corps Major Jasmine Mogabelli, United States Marine Corps. Jasmine is a native of New York and a graduate of MIT with a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering. She also holds a master's in aerospace engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School and is a distinguished graduate of the U.S. Navy Test Pilot Program. Before joining NASA, she was an AH-1 Cobra pilot with 150 combat missions flown over three operational deployments. Yeah. Seated to my immediate right is Colonel Randy Comrade Bresnik, United States Marine Corps, retired. A 1989 graduate of the Citadel with a bachelor's degree in mathematics, Comrade also holds a Master's of Aviation Systems from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. He is a graduate of the United States Navy Test Pilot School and has been with NASA since 2004. Before NASA, he was a Marine Corps F-18 Hornet pilot. He is a graduate of the Navy Fighter Weapons School, Top Gun, and has multiple combat deployments. He is a veteran of two missions into space, First shuttle mission, STS-129 in 2009, and then ISS Expedition 52 and 53 in the latter half of 2017, where he served as the ISS commander for the final three months of the five-month mission. He has over 150 days in space and has performed five space walks, logging 32 hours of EVA time. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for our phenomenal astronaut panel. Comrade.
take it away. All right, so for hundreds of years, people saw Pensacola from ships and portals. Well, the ship that uh, Tonto and I have had a chance to fly in, and Giles will hopefully get a chance to fly on soon, has portals as well. And here's Pensacola, not from offshore, but from 250 miles up. The, uh, you know, when you look a little closer, it's really nice to see the, the, the beaches and the, the bridges we have, and you can pick out the airfields you flew at and try to remember those course rules that always got you in trouble when you were in flight school. Um, and then Tonto got this next great picture of, the, of one of our zoom lenses where you can really see uh, the atmospherics change and the whole dynamic. Take it away. Yeah, one of the coolest things is just watching the sun glint change. Uh, when you look on your, on your phone at Google Maps, they very intentionally synchronize all their photography with the sun so that the pictures look the same around the planet wherever you zoom in. But when you're on the space station, you get to see all the different environmentals. And so you can see this is a great sun glint shot. Uh, the runways of Pensacola are very clear and uh, the beaches look beautiful. I think they're grooved at that point too. <laughs> yeah, they, they were grooved at that point. That's why everybody's, no. Uh, so uh, this is if you just take a little bit of a standoff and look at the edge of the earth. So this is, uh, a pretty nice night shot of, uh, of all of Florida. The solar rays of the space station are in that. Um, I don't know if the laser point is going to work too well. No, not on that screen, but down at the very bottom of that, that's Miami. And then you can go up the uh, east coast of Florida there, and you can even track it all the way across. I think right on the solar ray is, uh, is Mobile, Mobile Bay. So Pensacola is right in there. Um, it really starts to get spectacular when you get that full moonlit night. I'd make a a bolter joke here. There's a few in the front that may get it, but uh, you always bolter when it's a, f a nice moonlit night. But on the space station, it's gorgeous. So there's all the Bahamas and that crystal clear blue water. Uh, Cuba is there. You can see Havana, and then again up to uh, up to Miami. And then uh, we flew in yesterday. Well, I flew in yesterday from from Houston. They were up at Langley, and uh, there on the left side, that city is Houston. And if you track that across, about in the middle of that picture is New Orleans tracking across uh, Mobile Bay, Pensacola, and if you go all the way down the right side of that picture, uh, you got Miami. And uh, that's just one quick glance out the window. Uh, and that's about a human eye perspective. So the space station is a really amazing place to get to, to live and work. And we'll go into some of that um, in more detail later. So that's a pretty cool picture, isn't it? <laughs> and I've got to say how awesome it is to be back here in Pensacola. I winged just under 11 years ago, and I actually haven't ba been back here since then. But effectively, my journey and what got me to where I am today is Navy, naval aviation and through naval aviation. And I think about all the people I've met, the places I've been, and the things I've done because of that and because of coming through Pensacola, and it's amazing. And one, this crowd's incredible, but there are some people here that winged quite a bit before I did, and they also have some incredible stories of all the things they've done as a result of naval aviation. But then I look at all the the Marines and lieutenants in the, the, in the crowd and the ensigns in the crowd that are either in flight school right now or uh, waiting to start up flight school. And you're gonna have some incredible sea stories as a result of coming through this place and going on to naval aviation. I bet some of them already do. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, Jasmine, thank you. Uh, it's an honor definitely for all three of us to be to be here in the cradle of naval aviation. This is a happy spot for all of us. Uh, Stirl stole some of my thunder, but I want to go through a few names. This is the spirit of exploration right now. So uh, the first American to depart our planet was Al Shepard on a ballistic flight, uh, naval aviator. Uh, the first American to orbit the Earth uh, was not long after. That was uh, John Glenn, Marine Corps aviator. It's a Navy Marine Corps team for sure. Uh, the first American on the moon, the first human ever to step foot on the moon, that was Neil Armstrong. Many folks don't know he was a naval aviator before he transitioned over and became a NASA civil, uh, civilian pilot. Uh, the last, last human being to this point to step foot on the moon, uh, Gene Cernan, captain, naval aviator. Um, the first crew of the space shuttle, back when they launched that, it was a test mission, and that was uh, John Young and Bob Cripp and both naval aviators. The last crew of the space shuttle when we stopped flying that, that was Chris Ferguson and Doug Hurley, Navy Marine Corps team sitting up front of that space shuttle. Uh, the first commander of the International Space Station, that was Bill Shepard, U.S. Navy SEAL. Um, and the list kind of keeps on going as we move into commercial crews. So the thing I want to point out, there are, there are a few Air Force in here, so I'll be gentle, but whenever there's a first or a last, it seems like NASA and I think our country turns to the Navy Marine Corps team and we get the job done. So that makes me super proud. It should make all you proud as well. Okay, so for those of you that don't know, I was just picked up in the 2017 class. So um, those of you in flight school now, just remember you're never done training. So <laughs> I'm in the initial portions of, of training right now to become an astronaut. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So you see the picture of the T-38s up there. 
one of the first things we did is get called up in the T-38. And the, my classmates who weren't, didn't have a military aviation background, came here to Pensacola to start off to get their basics of flying an aircraft, basics of comm, nav, the six T's, which you obviously need to know going forward. So they came back here to start that. And then we fly the T-38s, and, and everyone uh, maintains proficiency in the T-38s. Because when you think about it, you can't, you know, in flight school, you can go on a flight every day to maintain your proficiency, but you can't just keep going to space every day. You have to spend some time back here on Earth. So what do we do that has real-world consequences on a regular basis where we're working as a crew to make those decisions real time? And the T-38 provides that for us. So that was one of the um, major parts of training. Uh, another section is learning how to do the spacewalks. And so what you see uh, in the photo above is a picture of the neutral buoyancy lab. And that's just a fancy way of saying a really big pool. It's, the world's largest yeah, pool. Yeah, the world's largest pool. It has a life-size mock-up of the International Space Station. I think it's over six million gallons of water or something like that. But it's a very large pool with a mock-up of the International Space Station. And what they do is they put us uh, in the spacesuits and we have a large team of people helping us. So every time two crew go in there to practice spacewalking, you have safety divers, you have a test coordinator, test director, all this crew, um, dozens of people to help execute that training. And so what they're doing here is a way out. So you get in the space suit and they're trying to make you neutrally buoyant so you're not floating up, not floating down, don't have any riding moments to simulate being in weight, the weightlessness of space. It's a nice picture of uh, Tonto Thank going you. under the water. <laughs> it's, when you go underwater, it's six and a half hours. There's no bathroom, there's no food, you got about a liter of water. So it makes for a, a long day. But these are the same suits, the same tools, and everything on the outside of the space station underwater. It's just like it is out in space. So you train like you fly. And you think about it, that spacesuit is your own personal space vehicle. So learning how to work with it and work in it, you know, move with the joints, not fight it every time. It's pressurized, so every time you're gripping, there's resistance. And so, like you said, it's six hours every time. It's, it's hard to see. Right under the flag there, uh, there's a little tiny book, and that truly is our pocket checklist. And there's bold face procedures, there's memory actions for different emergencies and things like that. It all, our culture is very much rooted in, in aviation, and the things that have kept us safe for 100 years also keep us safe when we're, when we're outside the space station. Okay, so the third major part of our training is training on the International Space Station systems. Very similar to flight school or learning a new aircraft, we have to learn our vehicle. So going through all the systems, the propulsion, the communications, the avionics, the life support systems, you have to learn that station and how to maintain it. Um, the International Space Station is a flying laboratory, so for the most part, you have mission control and the ground helping to fly it. But um, in certain instances where there are contingencies, you need to get involved and know those, uh, the systems of the space station. So learning those systems is a key part of our training. And then another part, and something I love about space, is the international cooperation that takes place in space. And it's interesting to think about how, you know, the space race started from this, you know, kind of international competition. And now space is one of the places where we cooperate most with other uh, other countries and partner with them. And so the International Space Station, you know, we have the U.S., we have um, ESA, the European Space Agency, the Canadian Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, as well as the Russian Space Agency. And so that brings me, one of the next large portions of our training is, is learning Russian so we can communicate with the Russian. Uh, you know, they've launched in Soyuz vehicles, which are Russian, Russian rockets, so uh, learning Russian is another big part of our training. And then uh, the final largest piece of our training is the robotic arm. So uh, Canada's robotic arm um, allows us to do a lot of things. So spacewalks, although we do them pretty regularly now, there's still, there's still a lot of risk involved in sending humans out the door and into the vacuum of space. And so anything we can do with the robotic arm, like recently we had a component that we needed to swap out, and they didn't need to send anyone out the door because they were able to do it with 
the robotic arm, so training on how to operate that robotic arm, similar to flying an aircraft in many ways. So those were the kind of five major portions of training, but now I'm gonna talk about all the other things we need to learn to do, because when you go up there, you're, you're a little bit of every, everything. You don't necessarily have your own doctors. You don't necessarily have your own maintainers. You are performing all those functions. So it was really cool for me coming from being a quality assurance officer out in Yuma at the operational test squadron and be, you know maintenance department being near and dear to my heart coming out at Ellington Field and doing the maintenance on the T-38s myself and watching the first time one of my classmates got to fly in an aircraft that I did maintenance on. <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> Here you've got two test pilots. So my classmate Josh, he's one of our Canadian astronauts, and myself. Um, we did a course in biomedical training, so the basics of bi biomedical. And I hadn't taken a biology class since freshman year of college, I think, maybe even high school. Um, but you think about, like I said, the International Space Station is this orbiting laboratory. When you do cell cultures down here on Earth, it's 2D, right? But when you get up in space, those, those cells can be suspended, so you can form 3D tissues more that would be more realistic. And so the science that we do up there, we need to be uh, scientists as well. Doctors, you don't necessarily have a doctor up there. There are some astronauts that are doctored, but you need to be ready to perform any sort of medical that needs to be done while you're on a mission. And as we start talking about longer and longer duration missions, that's obviously a critical component. Dental even, you know, you, you, may, not be, uh, you may not be as good as a normal dentist, right? They spend several years during the training, but at least taking care of it enough till that mission is over. I, I gotta take one quick story. So. I'm going to interrupt Jasmine about 100 times. Uh, I am one of those naval aviators that the sight of blood, even just drawing blood at my annual physical, basically puts me out. That's, that's about the end of my day. And so going through the medical training for me was horrifying. And they'll take you, and they took me downtown Houston and made me stand duty in an ER on a Friday night so that I could Payday get over Payday Friday this. night. What's that? Payday Friday night. Payday yeah. Friday night. So, I mean, the, the stupid people tricks was vast, and I saw things that I never want to have to see again, and then your dental story. So they, then they take you to this dental uh, surgery place, and the people will come in. This lady came in. She had to have her tooth removed, and they go, uh, would you mind if this astronaut in training removes your tooth? And she said no, and I had to take this lady's tooth out. I mean, it is the training is amazing, but I tell that story because... When you're on space, we had, we had two fires and a, a water burn, actually. A guy had pretty se severe burns. And you're the only doctor who's up there, and you got to make these decisions, and, and you can't be scared of blood. I, I drew my own blood for six, six months. About every week, I'd have to go draw my own blood. So it's just like uh, maybe fear in the airplane or, or fear in combat. Training gets you through all of those things and gets you ready to perform. And then when you're actually performing that stuff, it's, it's second nature. Thanks. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, learning how to actually move and operate in in a microgravity environment, um, learning that just just a little tap does a lot. It goes a long way when there's nothing to resist. So, uh, so this was a Canadian okay. aircraft. And then with the uh, test balling background, I've gotten to do some of the valuations on the uh, new NASA's new vehicle, the Orion spacecraft, and do some uh, basically cockpit evaluations. What can I reach? What can I see when I'm wearing this suit and strapped in, strapped into the seat? Geology is something I would have never thought before was so interesting. I was like, okay, rocks, that's, you know, <laughs> it's really cool. But um, we spend actually quite a bit of time learning geology because you're also the geologist, you know, in many cases. And when we're talking about going to uh, new planetary bodies and evaluating, hey, how, how did this region of this planetary body form? And so we, we go on these geology trips, and you're basically playing detective, studying the actual rocks themselves, studying the way they're formed, the, the lines, the patterns, and everything, and playing detective, trying to figure out the story of how that region came about. Was it volcanic activity, or, or what was it? And so that's actually been a really cool part of the training. And also another thing, this picture is actually from a Knowles Trips or outdoor leadership course. Expeditionary training is extremely important. Leadership training and team skills, um, when you're 
when you're going to be going on these long duration missions and and stuck in a capsule with someone for who knows how long without that much space you want to make sure you've got those skills to to basically not go crazy right you've got to be able to interact and work with and compromise with your teammates so a zero g fist fight is a hysterical <laughs> thing to watch can't wait <laughs> All right, so that, uh, so how long is that process, that training that you just went through? So it's about a two-year process. So we started August of 2017, so hopefully this, uh, this summer we'll be finishing up. Um, and at the, yeah, at the end of that, it's like you're at the end of flight school. So now you're, you're ready to get assigned to your fleet mission. You're ready to go to space. So I'm going to take over from Jasmine, and we'll, we'll go through uh, a little bit about life in, in space, uh, what we call low-Earth orbit. So taking the basic training that, that Jaws just mentioned and taking it now to the operational level. Uh, we train a lot with the Russians. Uh, Randy and I both rode in Russian spacecraft, and so you have to learn how to survive if you come down anywhere in the world. So one of, one of their favorite activities is they take you in a van about 30 kilometers outside Moscow in January or February, and they just dump you out with a fake Soyuz capsule, and the only thing you got in there is your survival gear to survive. So we took our parachute, cut it up, made a... Uh, made a little shelter there. You can even see it's kind of brown at the top because we had a fire going in there for three days. Um, and then we got all our survival gear. It was actually pretty, I thought it was pretty nice. It was outstanding training. You certainly got to know your, your folks really and well. we had the warm winter because it was only minus 10 outside and the Russians complained that it was too warm to do survival training. Very nice, very nice. And an interesting thing on, uh, on the Russians, see those, those trees that are used to build, I'll call it a TP, uh, there, you're not allowed to cut down trees in Russia. So when you go out and you're searching around the woods in this survival zone, you're, you will stumble upon a few pre-cut trees that are exactly the right shape to build your shelter, which I thought was really great. Um, that will not happen at Sears School. And then uh, you, we, we land in these, in these capsules that, uh, on the earth, but you could come down in the water, so you got to know how to uh, change into your suit. That, that little Soyuz capsule there, I'm going to show you in a second, is absolutely tiny. And you got three grown men or women that are all trying to change into survival gear, all on top of each other inside this tiny capsule, and uh, it's pretty crazy. Um, that's me uh, inside. It's a very tiny spacecraft. Uh, I once, I think I put this picture on Facebook, and my buddy wrote back, are you flying a spacecraft or driving a tank in Uzbekistan? And uh, I think that's a pretty accurate description. This is not a human factors miracle. This is 1960s Russian technology that is extremely reliable and redundant. It's loads of margin. Uh, the thing that is worth pointing out here is the book I'm holding is, our, is like our NATOPS. Everything's in Russian. All the comms in Russian. The, the ground control that you're talking to is in Russian. So uh, learning, at least learning space Russian um, is really important. Anything they you want they to say it's only difficult the first 10 years you're trying to learn Russian. <laughs> um, but the, the capsule is literally is as big as you're seeing as my arms. And as Tonto mentioned, you're changing, as part of the training, changing out of your pressurized launch and entry garment into your survival equipment inside that space on top of your crewmates where you can't reach parts and they're having to help out. And this is one of the points where you really hope to forget uh, some of the things you learned about your crewmate after well, the time you're done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... Uh, that, that little vehicle there launches three people into space at a time. So this is my crew. Um, I want to point out these folks real quick. In the center is uh, this guy, Max Sarayev. He's a Russian. He's actually a Russian senator now. But in his prior life, he flew uh, Su-27s, which is just a phenomenal uh, Russian-built aircraft. And uh, it was pretty interesting to me. I, I did 12 years operational Navy. And in that 12 years, I spent every ounce of my time in the books learning how to defeat basically that aircraft. And here's the guy who's flying. He's one of my best friends. I talk to him all the time. And then over on the left is Alexander Gerst. He's a German uh, volcanologist. And uh, that guy is a walking computer. He knows everything about everything. Uh, and then uh, I love this picture of Randy's crew. They're walking down Red Square, which for me growing up at the end of the Cold War, uh, when you see uh, St. Basil's Cathedral there in real life and you're walking through Red Square, it, it makes the hair on your arm stand up. And, uh, and we're partnered together. So Randy's in his, uh, his dress uniform. Uh, to his right is... Um, um, Sergei, Rosansky. Sergei Rosansky, he is a uh, Russian medical researcher, and then Paolo Nespoli was an Italian Special Forces operator. And, so, you, and for all the Marines out there, you notice that the other two guys are out of step. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you debrief them on that. It can't be the colonel. Um, <laughs> And so one thing that, that really struck me as I was going through this training with these individuals and looking at Randy's crew, you know, in the last 60, 70 years, all these countries have been at war with each other. And uh, if you put Paul, this is maybe a little too soapboxy for this room, but I think you'll find as you go around the world and you, you deploy and you meet people 
in these countries that we are at war with, you are going to find common bonds, uh, common bonds, and uh, you're going to build relationships. And, and when you get down to a people level, most times people are good, good folks, and uh, and we love. Uh, we came back great friends, and I know Randy did as well with his crewmates. Um, we're going to get to space in just a second, I promise. Uh, so when they're assembling our vehicle, uh, this is the building where they assemble it. You can see on the left there is that uh, white shroud that we launch under, and then there's a, a gentleman on the right, and he's saying uh, the path to the stars is open, and that's uh, Korolev. He's like the godfather of, of Russian, space, uh, Russian space. And when you go over to Russia, the name Yuri Gagarin, that is complete 100% national pride. That is the first human that ever left our planet, went into space. And, uh, and they still, they loved the fact that Yuri was first. And that is still a huge deal to them. Uh, they have a, a Russian cosmonautics day for, it's like a national holiday for Yuri. Um, it, so Jasmine went through two years of training. I did the same training. And then it took me another two years before it was time to fly. And at the end of that two years, they hand you the keys to the rocket. That's us at the business end of a Soyuz. There's a ton of uh, exhaust there. It's uh, five main engines that get you off the pad. A um, couple more slides. Uh, they roll it out on a train. Uh, you really need to think of this thing as a ballistic missile. It, it's, it's really all it is. You just put people on it. It's a totally analog booster. They roll this thing out on a train. They prop it up on the pad. They hit the go button. And by the time you're just a few hundred feet in the air, they pull a fire truck out. They're hosing down the pad, and they're getting ready for the next missile to come on out to the pad. It's, it's an amazing machine, the way they have this thing built. You talking about the helicopter? Yeah, exactly. Nice. That's a two-blade. Um, this is a quick video that Randy had. This is them lowering. So this is like the erection of the rocket, lowering it down into this launch facility. About a third of the rocket is underground. Uh, when you launch, and it's about five millimeters of clearance on those engine nozzles as they lower this thing down. It's, it's really wild how they put this whole system. And we in. launch out of the same launch pad that, that Yuri Gagarin left the Earth, and so that's a pretty cool part of space history. You think about being here in the cradle of avi naval aviation, you know, even the admirals and everybody that come back that retired, you know, still feels that same kindred spirit to the particular location. And it is the middle of no, truly the middle of nowhere. I, I've never been to a more remote place in my in my life. Uh, there's Randy and his crew, uh, Randy, Sergey, and Paolo all packed in there. And you can see now from that aspect with the hatch, that thing at the bottom, that hubcap is the hatch. And uh, there is no spare, uh, no spare room. You see, we're like pieces of pizza. And so, you know, our shoulders are the wide part. And you can see underneath that hatch is kind of where our feet are. And if you go to the next one, you can see that uh, once you fly in Soyuz, you absolutely have no complaints about economy class on an airline ever again. Never. Um, all right, so let's, uh, let's get off the earth. I'm just going to do about a two-minute video. It's very Tonto-centric, sorry. People ask me what's the hardest part about leaving the planet for six months. It's just like being in the military and going on deployment. It's saying goodbye to those two kids. Uh, that, that never gets easy. Uh, we launched in the middle of the night. That's the lead Russian engineer, and he just leans in and says everything's going to be successful, and that's certainly what you hope for. Uh, you climb up, climb up a little staircase there, and uh, that rocket is spewing uh, steam behind you, and uh, that thing is alive from the second you climb on. About two hours after you get on board the rocket, they light the engines. Um, you burn down fuel for just a little bit on the pad, and then it's time to go. And they throttle the engines up to 100%. Uh, there is liftoff right there. It's a very smooth ride uphill. Uh, you, you get to invite 14 people. I invited my family. That was probably a smart decision. There's my brother, uh, my mom, my best friend growing up. And uh, the only thing lighting them up there is our, is our exhaust. And it's Russia, so they are ridiculously close to the rocket. Far inside what NASA would ever, ever allow. Um, I want to put in perspective this ride uphill. So uh, you started the pad at zero knots, and you're going 17,500 miles an hour at the end of that, and it's about a nine-minute ride. So it's four. You build up as the fuel weight's burning off. You build up to four Gs, and you just stay there that whole way up. And uh, you get a little bit of G delta in some of the staging, um, but you're, you know you're going somewhere. And that pressure, it's not fighter pressure. It's pressure right through your stomach, uh, right through your chest, and uh, it feels good because you know the engines are going. Uh, when you get to, to space, there is a main engine cutout, and so we're, we're weightless there in our suit. And uh, this is the first time for me that I had ever been to space, and uh, that is an amazing feeling. And then you have that euphoria moment where the Russian rocket worked and you made it. And, uh, and our Russian was as surprised as we were. And then uh, that's a little stuffed animal. That was the first toy my mom ever gave my first kid. And so we had that dangling from a string. I may, may talk more about that in a minute. And this is a GoPro out the window, first look outside. Um, there is, there's no picture, there's no video that does that, uh, sorry, it went on. There's no picture, no video that does that view justice when you get to look outside with your eyes. And I think as aviators, you know, you know, you can spend a thousand hours in a simulator, you can look out the window in a Southwest airplane, but until you're sitting in that seat, in that T6 or in that T45 and looking outside, or I'm sorry, 
47? Fifty-seven. Fifty-seven. The TH fifty-seven. I mean, there's nothing like that. Like, there's no comparison to that human emotion, that human exploration of seeing something the first time for yourself. And that horizon you saw out the window that you got to see for the first time. Your whole life, the horizon is flat, and so the first time you get to space and you look out, and all of a sudden it's like this. Then now your eyes can then extrapolate the rest of that circle, and all of a sudden this big earth that you've been flying in airplanes and helicopters really around becomes a lot smaller and then an hour and a half later you're around the whole planet then you realize really how you know small and finite you are uh that that little um that little giraffe that was on a string i, I want to point this out the tomcat used to have a little string on the front of it but never underestimate the russians in a simple solution so that the whole reason that giraffe is on a little string is so that you know that your engines are running we don't have any engine instrumentation whatsoever. And when third stage comes on, you're almost uh, in space, you're pretty weightless. But as long as that little giraffe was straight down on that string, that meant I had thrust and I was going to space. And then when that thing's floating around, you know you're in space. It's amazing how uh, an animal on a string becomes a piece of space instrumentation. All right, let's see if I advance, if it'll go. Uh, I'll hand this to Randy. So I, I was watching Randy's launch when he went up on the Soyuz, and I thought, this is the most gorgeous thing I've ever seen in my entire life. So we launched just after twilight, so it was dark on the ground, but still light in the upper atmospheres, and that's why you can see this so well. And as you're watching, you're seeing the plume from the engine getting wider and wider apart. You know, we know that the air gets thinner, and this is a you know, visual representation of what that looks like. And what you see, the little white things flickering around, those are those four engines that came off the first stage floating back to Earth as we're heading uphill. That's amazing, I love that video. Uh, once you get into space, that, that nine minute ride's over, it's time to dock to the International Space Station. Um, since this is an aviation-centric audience, I wanted to throw this slide in. This is a look out the video display. The space station's in the crosshairs, and we're getting ready to rendezvous. Um, the sensor that they use, it's a totally automated rendezvous. We didn't have to control anything at all. They, uh, they just use state vectors, and then they turn on a, basically a radar, and it finds the space station and starts the docking. But when you're going through school, probably being taped here, when you're going through school, you start to learn how this radar works and how it orients the spacecraft. And if anybody goes back and studies the AIM-9 Mike missile, it is identical in every way, the way it finds that station and then homes in on the central point. And uh, I thought that was really amazing. Uh, as I'm going through, I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, uh, that's pretty much identical. All right, great. Um, and then this is, uh, I think this Randy spacecraft coming up the dock. You can see the thrusters firing and uh, the little Soyuz spacecraft has found its way to the International Space Station. And that thing will stay up there the entire time we're up there. That becomes our lifeboat and it hangs out with us. And it's just four orbits around the planet. So six hours after you launch, you're now docked to the space station ready to get to work. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's like a sniper shot. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. When you're standing at the launch pad, if you're not on the rocket, you can watch the space station fly over, and right as it gets past you, they launch the rocket, and then it chases it down. It's just like lead turning off the carrier to do your join up. It's uh, pretty cool. All right, so uh, the, the next video is going to be an uh, internal view of the space station, so I wanted to give you a little bit of situational awareness on the outside. Uh, the huge arrays down the left and right side, this thing's about the size of a football field, so that can, can cue you in on size. Those arrays, that's all of our power. We have no engines, we have no nuclear power. We've got those arrays and they hold power from the sun and then they store them in batteries from when we're uh, behind the earth. Um, and then that is all connected to the space station via this truss stuff, which is moving horizontal. The only place that we live are those cylinders. That, there's two that stick off the front, left and right, and then there's a central stack that goes down the middle of the space station. And uh, in the next slide, I'm gonna start at the very back end of the space station and I'm gonna fly through the front. You'll see it's a, it's a pretty big place. And if there's no audio, I guess I'll be narrating. miles an hour in this direction. And so I'm going to kick off and we'll do a quick fly through the stack of the International Space Station. We'll pass some fun things on the way. Oh, it's over here. Dinner table again. Got Max. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> it's very difficult. Squeeze through the Russian segment. <laughs> Especially when Max is here. <laughs> so that's down in the Russian segment. That's where the Russians live and work. And then I'm going to start cruising through this, uh, basically a closet. And now we're going through into the FGB. FGB is like a big closet. Looks like all of our nice, spare gear. Nice flight path here. We should be able to make it. There's a mirror on the right. Down into node one, station's gonna open up. Butch, go high! That's Barry Wilmore, a Navy captain, A7 pilot, Hornet guy. Quick aileron roll. 
through the lab, into the ball form. A little spin into node two over Alex's crew quarters. And here we are at the very front end of the International Space Station. Still going 18,000 miles an hour. So you can see it's a, it's a big environment. It's a big place that we live and work in. You can get lost up there. Um, we're up there usually with six people. And, uh, and there, it's really not too cramped at all. I never felt like I, I wanted to get off that thing. I just absolutely love I could have taken a port call, but I, I love being on that space station. But we're there to do science. You know, there's all types of science and research that goes on in the microgravity environment, you know, zero G. Whether it is, you know, biological, chemical, where it's using us in these torture machines to measure our muscles, um, working on combustions research, fluids research, Joe Acaba here growing actual lettuce up there in space so we can see if we can take a handful of seeds instead of boxes of food. Uh, and that's one of my favorites, a uh, experiment that was actually growing lung tissue. And the whole experiment was actually using targeted treatments to actually target cancer cells and not all the cells in the body like chemotherapy does. So one of those things that has real world applications that we can do only in zero gravity, but if we can get medicines that target only the cancer cells, then that's going to be pretty revolutionary for us here on the ground. So why are we doing this research up there? Why aren't we doing it down here on Earth? And uh, I think this video is a it's a pretty funny video, but it encapsulates it. So that is a gigantic sphere of water that we built. Uh, turns out I didn't, I was telling them earlier, I didn't know until I got home, but that's completely illegal uh, to do that in, a, in that environment there in case it creeps behind the walls. We had a GoPro and we stuck it inside the water ball. ball. There, the only difference between a bottle of water that Jasmine's drinking and that water right there is just one constant, gravity. That's the only thing that's changed, right? And all those little spheres there are little spheres of air, little air pockets inside that water. And so if you take that, Removing gravity from the equation, just weird things start to happen. They start to happen in human tissues. They start to happen in the way plants build how, or, or uh, grow. How do fish swim around when they don't have a gravity vector? Um, what happens if you cut a worm in half? How does it regrow? Uh, all those sorts of things. You can figure out a lot about what's going on down on Earth by looking at it without gravity. Um, we built that huge ball of water, and then for the next like two or three weeks, all I wanted to do was goof around uh, with water in space. So I had a medical syringe, and uh, I really wanted to see if I could get water to bounce off of itself. So, uh, you know, just like in a glass, water has a little meniscus on the top of it. That's just surface tension, and the only thing holding that water ball together right there is surface tension. So if you hit it a little too hard, you add water to the bubble, and if you hit it just right, you can bounce water off of it. And then I started thinking, what would happen if you throw an air bubble inside the water bubble? Does it make the water bubble pop? Does it make it bigger? So in a second here, I'll put the syringe in the top and throw a, uh, an air bubble in there. There's great uh, optical physics, too. I'm upside down in the, in the uh, water bubble. And then I'm going to throw this air bubble in there. And uh, I just I love the way it bounces around on the inner uh, surface tension. And at some point, I'll put my face up. And now I'm right side up in the air bubble, upside down in the water bubble. And uh, it's just, to me, that's fascinating. I love that. And then, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers 2014. It was a long time ago. There was this thing, uh, an internet sensation called the Ice Bucket Challenge. I think it was for ALS. And uh, as, a, as American astronauts, we cannot support any sort of fundraising campaign. But Alex Gerst was a German, and he wanted to do the Ice Bucket Challenge. And so we got that water down to 32 degrees in a refrigerator and uh, built another bubble, and, and he elected to, to shove his head into that freezing cold water. <laughs> and uh, the weird thing is, uh, water does does really odd things when it's uh, when it's up in space. This capillary flow phenomenon is crazy. And he, he just commented like how weird this water felt slowly creeping into his ears, up his nose, uh, all over the back of his head. It's very odd feeling. Um, just shows you it's, just, it's completely different when all you do is take away gravity. All right, so now I'm going to talk to this side of the room because it seems like all the Marines congregated to that side. You're probably asking where's the gym at? So <laughs> how do we work out in space, right? Because I I could lift a lot in space, but it's not, it's not really going to do much for me. It's not going to work me out. So we've got three main pieces of equipment. Uh, the bike, which you just saw, um, and it doesn't need a seat or anything. It's just a resistive device. The treadmill, which is on hey, the wall. It's on the wall. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, but you have this uh, strap. Basically, you, you wear this harness, and it holds you down so you can get your run in. And then I love this video. This is the A-RED. It's a resistive device. And... It uses <laughs> vacuums to create the resistance so you can get your deadlifts in, 
and all that. Yeah, you're all the way up to 600 pounds worth of weight, and but you don't want to impart the the vibrations and the loads into the space station. So this is all on an isolated platform, so we don't you know uh, disturb any of the science or experiments that are going on in the sensitive instruments on board. It's just like really impressive how fast you're going, though. <laughs> the time space continuum. <laughs> Oh, man. I like to I like to divide our days up into basically thirds. One third of our day is spent uh, maintaining the human body, so about two and a half hours in the gym every day. Uh, one third of our time is spent maintaining that space station. Uh, preventative maintenance is a huge deal, and then one third of our time is conducting the research for the researchers on the ground. And now Randy's going to talk a little bit about the greatest activity. And so there's certainly, you know, there's maintenance inside, there's maintenance outside. And so here is a, uh, a picture, Mark Van de Heij coming out the outside of the space station. And it doesn't matter if it is your first spacewalk or your 10th. When you uh, come out of that hatch, you're 250 miles up. And as if we all went to the top of the, the building here and put our toes on the edge and leaned over, you all know that feeling of your body getting scared and, and saying, hey, lean back. Well, you get that, you know, 10,000 times over. So here, if you click on the next one, it'll show you a video of what it's like. These are GoPros that we had on the outside of our suits, what it's like to come out there. And you have to overcome that physical fear because your whole life has taught you that if I let go up high like that, I'm going to fall. And so you have to come over that, get over that, and rely on your training. You come out and you do just like we do in the pool, you get in the same position, you touch the same handrails, you reach out, you take your tethers, you put them down the same place, and your body overcomes that natural fear, and you're able to go to work out there because that's what you're hired to do. Unfortunately, we don't get to spend all our time just out there uh, taking pictures. They actually have a, the space box are really busy. Um, you get in the suit, you pressurize, you do leak checks, you then have to do some in-suit light exercise to get rid of the extra nitrogen in your body so you don't get the bends. And then by the time you go outside, do the space walk, come back in, it's typically about 11 and a half hours that you're in the suit. And as Tonto mentioned, there's no food, there's no, you know, you get about a half a liter of water and that's it. And so it is something that you, a mental and a physical challenge while you're up there. This is Mark Van de Heij riding the robotic arm, repairing a, uh, an external light. And I caught this picture of him at the same time that my uh, crewmate, Sergei Rosansky, caught this picture of the two of us. So if you look at the solar array on the right side, up at the top of that, to the right of that, you can see the robotic arm and you can see Mark riding that. This is just half of the space station. This is just the left half on the bottom. There's a whole other side that mirrors it on the right side. It is the size of a football field out there. It is huge. And we have to go out there and do spacewalks to maintain it. But we are hitting our 19th year of continuous human presence on that space station. Here's what it looks like when you stop to take um, for a minute to take a look and realize what 17,500 miles an hour looks like. It's five miles every second, and that's how fast you're moving. By the time you see something, you need to get a camera out quick because the Earth's gone by five miles a second. And the reason, you know, that uh, Marines will understand that, you know, laminate it, dummy cord it, and take it to the field, we do a lot of tethering for every piece of equipment because it is floating. You let it go, and it has any type of force on it, it is gone. And so you have to uh, make sure that everything's uh, tethered together while you're in space. You know, sometimes, you know, the food's enjoyable for taste. Sometimes it's just kind of fun. If we get the audio on this, please. You guys can just keep the audio up. And so this is one of our cargo vehicles that brought up pizza. And so it was the best pizza we had ever had because it was so <laughs> different than any of the space food or irradiated MRE type of food that we had up there. We warm it up in a, a uh, uh, food warmer and then uh, got to have floated around. We called it the flying saucers of, of the edible kind. Scissors to cut it because you don't really you know, stay away from knives up there. That's of course the American you know, meat lovers pizza. <laughs> and this was the, uh, the Italian uh, one that was a little less meaty. But you know, you do things like this that are crew bonding, and then you, know, you have meals together, and you you take a break from all the experiments and the work you're doing every day. Photography. Uh, so we've shown a couple pictures from space. We're going to spend a couple minutes just to look out of of this amazing orbital platform that we have, and uh, and look back at our Earth. So where Randy is with his blatant advertisement for the Citadel, there is uh, he's in this thing. Yeah, great. Where was that one? All right, you can meet with Randy afterwards. You guys can share war stories. Um, so Randy's in this thing called the cupola. It's a series of six windows that go around the side and then a single window. It's about the size of a, a hubcap that looks straight down at the earth. 
And when you're not doing uh, science and you're not doing maintenance and you're not working on your body, this is where you want to spend all of your time. Um, I actually got into um, the series Breaking Bad when I was up there. And there was a Saturday where I'm just in my crew quarters with an iPad and I'm watching Breaking Bad. And I couldn't stop. And my German crewmate just comes by and whacks me in the knee. And he's like, dude, you're in space. And he was like, get out and look out the window, do something fun. So uh, there's many, many boat stories that are quite the same. But looking out this cupola is, is just absolutely epic. And then down in the Russian segment, we have a few optically pure windows that look straight down at the earth. And, um, and you, get, you get these huge long lenses and take these great pictures straight down at our, at our planet. It's really fun to do. Um, this one, uh, I think this is actually Randy's picture here. That's, that's the, uh, an eclipse as seen from space. The one that so, was just, you know, two years ago in the summer. That was what the eclipse looks like. This big, huge shadow on the Earth like it was some sort of science fiction death ray weapon from, <laughs> you know, some bad guy from space. Uh, you're going around the Earth once every, every 90 minutes. And so you get 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets a day. Um, something that I found from my time in the Navy was I just knew every place on Earth. It was, you know, I did two Westpacs, two uh, med cruises, and one, one around South America. And you cannot look out a window and, and not relate that to something that you saw in your military career. It's pretty cool. That's a Pacific Ocean with the uh, sun glint really illuminating the clouds there. Um, you can fly over typhoons and hurricanes. And you know the destruction under them, but when you're looking down from above, they're beautiful. Uh, that one, Randy. Turks and Caicos just after Hurricane uh, uh, Irma. So just really just amazing beauty that you get to look down on. Um, I didn't even, when I was, before I flew in space, I never really looked up and saw this, but you can see the shadows of clouds stretch all the way out to the horizon. And now that I'm back, I can see this at night when I, I stand on earth and look up, you can see these shadows, especially coming off of cumulonimbus clouds. You can see these shadows. And when you get to look down from above, they just spill across the edge of the earth. Uh, it was one of my favorite things to, to look at. Uh, you can definitely see nature's destructive power. That's a, a giant uh, forest fire and the, the smoke coming off of that. Um, you can look down and see the glaciers uh, when you're on the northern and southern latitudes. We go from about 51.6 north to 51.6 south in our orbital track. So in a given day, you see the entire inhabited planet. You don't get to see the poles. Um, uh, lots of uh, amazing volcanoes and uh, geology that you look down upon. There's a great volcano shot that Randy took. Um, and then you, without a doubt, when you look down at Earth, you get to see human hands just about everywhere. And, uh, and that's some reforming of the, uh, of the desert landscape there. Uh, we'll show a few others. And then, Randy, you want to talk to this and one? And so this was, uh, you know, we were up there for five months, and it was about month four and a half, where we finally had day passes over the Himalayas. And so, of course, what, you know, you're going to try and do, hey, I'm trying to find Mount Everest. And the proverbial needle in the haystack where the mountains are all gigantic and all you can do is look for, you know, the little bit bigger shadow than the others. And then finally we end up finding it. So right in the very center, that little peak and with what kind of one about the same height, that's Mount Everest. You know, the highest point on earth and it looks like just a little bump from 250 miles up. And then, you know, the nighttime you know, is a phenomenal time for photography. You can look at the Nile River ending up in the bottom part of the, the uh, picture ending up in the Nile Delta with Cairo and Alexandria. And just beyond that, you got Israel and Lebanon, just as the sun is about ready to come on up. There's the island of Cyprus. I don't know if anybody's pulled in there. Uh, good hosts. Uh, this is uh, really fascinating me. The city in the center, the white lights, that's Bangkok. And then if you look just to the right of Bangkok, there's loads of green lights. Those are all fishing vessels, and they're taking green uh, halogens and shining them down into the water, and it makes the squids come to the surface at night the squid, and they just take huge nets and scoop the squid right out of the water. It is absolutely incredible. Look at all those boats. You could almost walk across that. That's, uh, that's pretty impressive right there. Um, this is Seoul, South Korea, and we've got cameras now that are so good that we're able to take nighttime photography as if it was daytime. And so you can see the different colors in here. Those are different types of lights and the different, you know, materials that are inside of them, and they emit the different wavelengths that give us the different colors. The, uh, the next one will show you Seoul, Korea with the DMZ just above it. Crazy. And the next one will give you the difference oh, between... Hold on, no, I just got to soak that in for a second. So that is land above that border, and that's North Korea. That's incredible. And so the next one will show you the bottom of the slide is capitalism. The north of the part of the slide is communism. Crazy. That is crazy. And so it's amazing that, you know, in our lifetimes, in our time right now, we're talking, and, you know, this may not be like that. It may be different, and that's happening, you know, 
And so it would be great to see space, what North Korea looks like once we can turn the lights on. Uh, you always hear you can't see borders from space, and isn't that a ma magical thing? But, well, I say it's complete baloney. Um, on the left half of this is San Diego, North Island. You can see if you're, if you're savvy. And then to the right is Tijuana. And if you look straight down the middle on a little bit of a diagonal, that's the border. So it is very easy to see. You can see them all over the planet. Everybody likes to build these big borders. And then uh, you go into the, uh, the Aurora Borealis in Australia, and uh, it's really amazing. So those green lights that you can see if you're up in the northern and southern latitudes, you're basically flying through those on the space station. It's, uh, it's a lot of high energy particles. Um, if you fly through something like that, I was the IT guy on board. If you fly through something like that, you know you're changing eight to 10 hard drives on your laptops up there the next morning because you're gonna get bit flips and nothing will boot up. Uh, and I don't know what that's doing to us and our innards, <laughs> but we're gonna find out in a couple years, that's for How sure. How young you look, you know? <laughs> Uh, it's just, it's magical. You know, I, uh, I was up there for 160 days, almost uh, 165 days, almost six months. Uh, I took 300,000 photos. Uh, Randy was up there about the same time, and I think you eclipsed 300,000 by a good measure. Uh, our, our crew took eight, over 800,000 pictures. So his crew of six took 800,000 photos. So the, the thing I want to point out about that is there's never a moment that you look outside and don't reach for a camera. Our Earth is really a magnificent place uh, that we get to live on. And, and you know, you'll fly, you'll get trained, you'll fly, and a lot of you end up flying aircraft and, and rotorcraft that end up you know, flying at night, night vision goggles. And I used to think, you know, being an F-18 up in the 40,000 feet with night vision goggles, that was the most stars you could possibly see. And then you get up to space, and there's no atmosphere anymore to attenuate the light from these, you know, dim stars. And so just looking up at the star field out there was just always astounding to do. And this is looking at the Milky Way. I mean, that's almost solid white. From that many stars, and we have a little tiny sun with our solar system, with the you know the nine planets we have. So imagine how many planets are out there that we don't see that are all around all these bigger suns that make up that Milky Way galaxy. And this is a different angle of the Milky Way, looking right out the back of the space station. That's the orange thing is our planet. Um, those are basically ground up meteors in the atmosphere, making it look orange at night. And, uh, and there's the Milky Way. And I get asked all the time if there are aliens and if I saw them, you know looking out that picture, for sure, somewhere, there is some little green human-like people walking around some slimy planet. But that is, it's just amazing. You lose track of the constellations when you're up there because there are too many stars, you can't pick them out. Um, and now, um, you can't, it would be amazing if the space station laboratory was able to cure cancer or do something like that. I think the thing that we're going to take away from this $100 billion platform is commercialization of low Earth orbit. And I want to talk about that for just, uh, just a quick second. Uh, right now, uh, none of this is, uh, is tinker toy. This is all stuff that we're launching up there. The Russians launch, launch pro uh, progress resupply ships. The uh, Europeans launch AT ATV uncrewed resupply ships. The Japanese with the HTV. Um, and then we've got uh, now Northrop Grumman just bought out Orbital ATK. They launched Cygnus cargo vehicles. Everybody knows SpaceX. They launched the Dragon up there. They just launched one uh, last week, and it just got up to the space station and brought supplies up. And then on the human side, we all fly on the Soyuz right now. Um, SpaceX, this is the Demo-1 launch of their um, crewed vehicle that they hope to fly later this year. Uh, that Demo-1 launch went up in March, and then, uh, and then Boeing is closing in, I think in August, they're going to fly their CST-100 uncrewed test mission, and then they're going to put people on that uh, in early 2020. 11% of all rockets that leave our planet go to the International Space Station. That, that floored me when I heard that stat. Um, that is a whole economy right there. That's public-private partnerships, and uh, that is the way, in my opinion, uh, that we're going to get onto the moon and to Mars. So there's a, a little graphic of SpaceX and Boeing, both U.S. companies building crewed vehicles right now. Um, and they're not fake. They're real. You can go, uh, go to the Cape, and you can touch these vehicles. You can climb inside of them, and they're getting ready to launch them. Um, and that leads me here. So NASA's goal, we're going to continue operating the, the space station in low Earth orbit, and then we are going to go to the moon. And then once we have established uh, a presence on the south pole of the moon in 2024 through 2028, we are going to go on to Mars. And Randy's going to touch on some of that. And so speaking of real vehicles, the other vehicle that's being built, and the one that's been in production for quite a while, is the Orion spacecraft uh, built you know, our main contractor's Lockheed Martin. And it's similar to uh, the Apollo style. We've got a capsule, a launch abort escape system, and a service module. The uh, the thing is, that's the third vehicle. There's no country in history that has had more than one manned spacecraft flying at a time. And within the next three years, we're supposed to have three here in the U.S. flying off of U.S. soil. So that is certainly a good comeback since the last time we had a U.S. human-rated vehicle fly was STS-135 in 2011. 
And this is a real vehicle. We have EM1, the unmanned uh, demo mission is supposed to go off in June of next year. Uh, and then we also have EM2, exploration mission number two, which will be the first crewed mission. Uh, that's also at the Kennedy Space Center being outfitted and getting ready to go fly. Uh, the EM1 mission, you know, unman, demonstrate all the systems, demonstrate the navigation, the propellant, you know, and most of all, the number one data point is being able to come in back in the atmosphere from lunar velocities. So you'll see, you know, we come back from the space station, we're doing a Mach 25, and we have to dissipate all that energy to be able to get back down to the surface. Well, coming back from the lunar velocities, it's Mach 32. And so that's a lot more heat and a lot more energy we have to dissipate onto that heat shield. The way we get there is going to be the world's largest rocket most powerful rocket ever produced by humans. Uh, it takes the solid rocket boosters that we use on space shuttle, had four segments, and these have five segments on each. And we take the same type of RS-25 engines that were used on the space shuttle, repurpose them, and now we have four of those on the bottom of the big external tank uh, that we have in, in the center of those solid rocket motors. Exploration mission will go out to the moon, it'll loiter around the moon doing a, uh, uh, some orbits and check out of the systems and then come on back and test out that heat shield. And then in June of, or summer of 2022 is when we're expecting to have that very first human rated mission on the Orion vehicle. It's a Apollo 8 type of mission where we are gonna take the first time that Orion's ever flown with humans, we're gonna take off, go around the Earth, check out the systems, do a high Earth orbit at about 70,000 miles, and if everything's good to go, we're gonna fire the translunar injection burn and go to the moon. And we're going to do a free return, so that means we're going to go around the moon and use the lunar gravity to slingshot us back to the Earth without have having to do a whole bunch of burns. So it makes it really safe. Once you do the TLI burn, you can almost be assured that you're getting back to, back to Earth. And that's the first flight of the vehicle. We're not doing any low Earth orbit testing. It's also the first time we put humans on that SLS rocket, the most powerful rocket ever built. And so this is a very forward-leaning uh, exploration program that we have because uh, we're going to uh, go into the moon and hear the vice president say last month, boots on the moon, 2024, first you know, you know, man and woman that we've had there in the last 50 years. Okay, so he here's a depiction of the gateway. And for those who don't know what the gateway is, so we've talked quite a bit about the International Space Station. We've had, if we hadn't said it, said it yet, we've had that thing manned for 20 years with humans in space. So gateway is now the future. Gateway will be orbiting in lunar orbit. And so why, why are we doing that? Why the gateway? It provides the architecture we need to support the missions that uh, Comrade just talked about, putting boots on the ground in 2024 on the moon and then our future missions. So a lot of people have asked, wh why are we going back to the moon? We already did that. Um, one, because I wasn't alive when it happened, so I want to <laughs> yes. see it again. <laughs> um, but there, there are several reasons to do it. So I'm going to preface this. I'm a Cobra pilot that's about to try and explain a near rectilinear halo orbit. So <laughs> you it's said it gonna properly, be, so that was a it's going to be basic, and please no questions afterwards about this. But <laughs> I was told there would be no math. <laughs> okay, so when we, when we did Apollo, they were in a low lunar, lunar orbit about 60, 65 miles from the lunar surface. Gateway is going to be in this near rectilinear halo orbit, and at the closest point, it's just within a thousand miles, and at its farthest, it's like 45,000 miles from the lunar surface. And you're probably like, well, why are we so far away? But what it provides us, it's not, it's not a planar orbit, and it allows us to easily change the inclination of that orbit without using a lot of our propulsion. And so during Apollo, we almost exclusively explored the equatorial regions of the moon. So now we're talking about expanding that and, and doing it in a sustainable way. So we want to put boots on the ground on the south pole of the moon. Um, so this orbit and the gateway provides us the platform. First, for 2024, we're just talking about a power propulsion module and a utilization module, and that provides us the basic structure we need to get Orion up to the gateway, have the human lander system, and then put boots on the ground and the moon. And then it provides that architecture to build on uh, for the long-term mission, which, as was mentioned before, is Mars. So a couple things that the gateway provides us. It provides us this staging ground to 
put all these pieces together, you're not going to launch something out of Earth's gravitational field that's going to go straight to Mars. So you need something, somewhere to put that together um, as a staging ground. It allowed you a test bed to test not just the technologies, but also the operational procedures. You know, why, why go straight to Mars when you can test it somewhere where you have a few seconds of calm delay by several minutes of calm delay? You have a couple days back home by a couple months back home. So testing those things, how do we use in situ resources? If we start talking about these long duration missions, we can't, we can't put all the things that we're going to need on that vehicle from the get-go. We're going to be able to have to use the resources on, on the planetary bodies themselves. So the gateway provides us the framework to do that. And so it's extreme environment, you know, that we're going to, you know, either the moon or Mars. And so part of the training we do is we'll actually go do caves training with our ESA partners. And there's caves off of Sardinia where we will actually go in, take our international crews and go in there and live underground for a week. This picture is about two and a half miles from the entrance of the cave, and it is like a whole other planet down there. Most people, you know, you can go to Carlsbad Cavern and walk along the trail, but, I mean, this is, there are no trails. You are at, truly exploring, and we'll actually, in this cave complex, it'll take us out, and we're actually mapping out parts of the cave that have never been mapped out. And so you have this sense of excitement of the exploration. You're seeing something new every day. You're going through little squeezes or maybe big, huge caverns or finding areas like this that no one's ever seen or very few people have ever seen. And so it really gets you in the mindset of there's something new out there. We have to be safe. We have to make sure that our equipment and gear and watching out for each other works, manage our supplies and our consumables for how many batteries you have, how much you're using your light, exactly like you would on any spacecraft where everything you have is with you. Uh, and so... The, uh, you know, the, where we had our camp out, this was only a mile and a half in from the entrance of the cave. Um, but it is just astounding what it looks like down there. And so it's a great place to take people to get them ready to go to some place like the moon or Mars because it is nothing like you've ever seen and is, is completely, uh, completely new to you. We also will go down to the Aquarius habitat off the coast of Key Largo. And it's under 60 feet of water. And we'll go down there and live underwater to use another extreme environment to go ahead and train. It's about the size of a school bus. And we'll put crews down there to operate for a week to two weeks uh, training up in space. Yeah, the cool spot. So Randy and I got to do this uh, a few years ago. Living underwater. You're, uh, you're living at depth. And uh, it's, it is a pretty amazing thing. What we did for this experiment was pretending we were on Mars. So we did a lot of, uh, of research for some Florida universities. But... We worked with Mission Control and had a 15-minute two-way comm delay because that's how long it will take at the speed of light for communications to get out to Mars, process, and come back. And the tools that we ended up using uh, to solve this problem are, are in your pockets on your iPhones and your and your other, other devices. It was text messaging and being able to process this information. So you have to work in a totally different way when it takes 30-minute round trip for the information to get to you. Um, and then... It'll be awesome to get on, on Mars. I've never walked up to a mountain and not wanted to climb it. And I think everybody in this room probably feels the exact same way about exploration, you know. And so, you know, most of you probably saw the Martian, right? You know, he's poor guy's out there by himself. But, you know, as Tonto mentioned, you know, we've got this commercial, you know, government partnership going on right now. And it's working out pretty well for our, our commercial cargo vehicles for years, our commercial crews coming up. We're looking, we've got Bigelow Airspace building a space hotel. We've got Blue Origin doing their own thing all by themselves, you know, with their new Shepard rocket and their... Um, capsules. we got two companies that are landing the first stages of their rockets back on Earth and reusing them. I mean, that's the most expensive part of the rocket, and we've got not one but two companies. And we still don't, you know, quite realize how revolutionary that is, because that's what's going to cause, drop the, the cost of getting stuff to space and make it so much more accessible for everybody. And hopefully, you know, in all of our lifetimes, you know, you'll be able to take your kids someday and go, okay, kids, we only have, you know, $50,000 to go to Disneyland or space. You choose, you know. Um, <laughs> But that partnership's already happening because you remember, you know, Mark Watney, he called for the Uber and already, you know, Elon's got a car on the way to go pick him up. <laughs> and so it's certainly, you know, everybody's thinking about it. We've got multiple commercial companies doing it and the government and we are, have the political will to go forward with this plan to go get people back on the moon by 2024 to spur the, you know, continued development. And so this is a picture of my, my crewmates, Joe Acaba, a former Marine, um, took you can see he's got the whole world in his hands. And if, if you've, you know, gotten anything from, you know, the talk today, especially, you know, from, 
hearing from Tonto and I talk about how mesmerizing it is to, to see our planet and how, you know, Jaws is hopefully you know, one of the next people to go see it. Um, it it's humbling. You know, as we said, you know, it's, you go around the earth every 90 minutes. I mean, every person you've ever met and ever known, or every memory you've ever had is on this little blue marble you went around 90 minutes. I mean, that's, to me, that made me feel very humbled and very, very small, you know, not, not the opposite. And so it's hard to kind of convey that, you know, as a human experience to people because we can show you the pictures and video and you see that and it looks neat, but it, there's an emotion to it, seeing your planet and all your people down there uh, and being so you know, disassociated and detached from it, but yet seeing it is, is such a beauty. And so what uh, Sergey and Powell and I did, we took a bunch of pictures and video and got permission to use a particular song that hopefully as you watch it here for the next couple of minutes, might give you a little bit of the emotion of what it's like to be a human being to see your own planet from that perspective.
Well, you've got Tonto, Jaws, and Comrade up here, and I look around at all our, you know, ensigns, JGs, you know, first and second lieutenants. We were you just many, many years ago. I mean, we sat exactly where you sat. I trade thought, with them all right now. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to be 23 and back in Pensacola. You know, we, we were you guys, and you've got your whole career ahead of you, and, and we wish you all well and safe, you know, uh, training. But hopefully the work that we do now sets the stage for you guys to see the earth from that vantage point sometime in the future. And so, Sterles, over to you for the rest of the show. Do we have time for questions? Absolutely. Got your, your. Now, here's your opportunity to talk to three wonderful naval aviators who also happen to be astronauts. So, we got mics. Admiral Gordney. Uh oh. Good afternoon. <laughs> thanks, Admiral. Hola, Isabel. Um, Donna, first off, thanks for uh, honoring me at uh, a tail hook on your mission. That was my honor. Yeah. Thanks to three of you representing our Navy and Marine Corps so well. Thank you, sir. Now, we have the future of Navy and Marine Corps aviation right here, and they want to know, as I do, because I'm currently unemployed, how does one go about doing what you're doing? How do, how do they and old un, uh, unemployed um, naval officers get to do what you do? How did you enter into your path, and how will you do in the future do you see them being able to do the same thing? Yeah, so since um, I'm the most recent one to get picked up for this job, I'll, I'll take that one. So there are a lot of things you could do that will probably ensure you don't get here, but there's, there's no way to ensure you will get here. But I can tell you some of the important things. Um, you know, things like a technical background in, in science and math and the engineering field is going to be important. Um, but at the end of the day, I can tell you, I talked a bit about the soft skills, but the reason I think I'm here is because of those team skills. And you're going to learn that in the Marine Corps, you're going to learn that in the Navy and any branch of the military, camaraderie and teamwork, working together with a crew. I mean, it's imperative for everything we, we do up there that you're able to work together in a crew. Whatever, whatever it is you do, do, do something that you love and do it well and do it as well as you can. There's not one specific, I'll tell you my class, like we're all naval aviators up here, but we have geologists in my class, we have scientists, we have doctors, uh, we have a submariner. We have so many diverse backgrounds, but they all excelled in their individual fields. Um, so excel at whatever you do, but do something that you love. Um, Yes, sir. During the early years of, of space exploration, it was basically the United States ran the show. And NASA was in charge, and they set up a, a number of rules and regulations and protocols for sterilizing equipment that went up, especially that was going to other planets, to make sure we didn't introduce anything earthly that might either be misidentified as something from that planet, or worse, uh, be an invasion with uh, something that, that doesn't have any natural enemies. With commercial space now, is there, is there more of a risk now of contaminating places we go because not everybody is working to the same uh, ethic about keeping things clean? And that goes for other countries as well. So is there a risk now that, that uh, we will misidentify some of what we find up there? I, I'm going to start that answer, and then I'm going to hand it to Randy. But first, I don't know that anybody in here knows that this is a living legend asking this question. <laughs> Hank Caruso, amazing, uh, amazing artist. You'll see his art on the walls everywhere. You had to know you were going to be a target quickly, uh, and then I'll hand it to Randy for a good answer. Now, certainly, you know, we had the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 and all these other intergovernmental agreements that have come along since then, where we're not supposed to have, you know, the peaceful uses of outer space. We're not supposed to own celestial bodies. Only reason I know this stuff is because I'm married to a very smart woman who happens to be the lead international law attorney at Johnson Space Center. So um, she teaches a space law course, and that's how I've gotten this stuff by osmosis. Um, 
But recent changes uh, where the U.S. government has actually passed laws saying, that, yeah, you can't own a celestial body, you can't own property, but if you go up there and mine it, what you mine, you can keep. Now, that doesn't mean that every planet agrees with, or I'm sorry, every country on, the, on this planet agrees with that. But certainly that's going to spur perhaps commercial competition. The moon has helium-3 in the soil. They say a truckload of that could light this, you know, the city of New York City for a year. Well, do you think that just probably has some value? And do you think that is probably something that maybe a commercial company can make a business case for? And so right now they're trying to figure out not only the commercialization of the, of, uh, the moon, but with the International Space Station, we've owned the building, we've rented out the floors, we've done all the work on it all these past 19 years. Well, we're trying to turn it into a, uh, a building where, you know, Tonto's company comes and rents out the second floor and Jaws has the third floor, and all we do is keep the lights on and the toilets running. You're kind of like the base commander here. And so um, that, if we can do that in low Earth orbit with the space station, then well, that may be the model we use for what we do beyond the planet. And certainly the, the um, contamination is something that, you know, as we develop this commercial space and commercial interplanetary stuff, that's where an FAA-like organization that is more, you know, planet-based and all the countries are signatories to will need to be set up so we don't, we can explore, you know, utilize the in-situ resources to, you know, take water and make hydrogen fuel and make oxygen to breathe or maybe, you know, uh, terraform some of the soil to be able to grow food. But do we do that in a smart way so we're not ruining the, the body that we're, that we're at? Two, two interesting side notes to that, and then I'll let you sit down. Uh, the outside of the space station's got bacteria on it. Shouldn't, but it does, and it's alive, so that's pretty interesting. The Russians found that out uh, fairly recently. And then uh, Kate Rubin's a fellow astronaut. She just wrote a paper on uh, one of the first things we want to do when we go back to the moon is go sample the Apollo sites and see what did we leave behind. What were our processes correct? I think that's really fascinating. You know, hey, can we detect human presence? We know we've detected it in uh, the temperature of the moon. Uh, that study just recently came out that just from the Apollo program, we raised a perceptible amount, the temperature of the moon for a few years, and then it settled back down. So it's almost impossible to go do anything and not disrupt that habitat. It's a great question, Hank. And think about it, Jaws mentioned that near direct linear halo orbit is polar. Well, all the Apollo stuff was equatorial. How do we get from the South Pole to the, equi you know, to the equators? That's where people talked about, hey, do we have a system where we're able to land the South Pole at our big base, like McMurdo or something, and use the water that's at that pole, separate it out, make that hydrogen fuel I mentioned, and then hop over to the equatorial point to go get the data points from our, our Apollo landing sites. So all kinds of really neat stuff that's going on right now. Thanks, Hank. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, gentlemen. So for all the people in the world that think we're spending way too much money on this stuff, uh, what would be your elevator pitch for why we should be in space? It takes an hour and 10 minutes, um, and we just gave it. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, when I was, I was basically in your shoes, and I, I heard somebody ask an a, a, a space shuttle astronaut the same question, and I thought that they had a, just a really great quick answer. And so this is not the elevator pitch, but when we used to launch the space shuttle, we did not launch this thing into orbit, open up the cargo base, and just let money float out of it, right? All of this money that we're putting in, 100 billion basically into the space station, that money is going into jobs, it's going into industry, it's going into motivate the youth to go and not everybody's going to be an astronaut. Never everybody's going to be a, a, a Navy Marine Corps pilot. But if you can motivate somebody and push them in a technical field, they very well could be in Silicon Valley inventing the next thing that uh, cures heart disease or stops cancer or any of these things. And so we shouldn't underestimate the impact that just doing exploration has um, on our entire human race. And the NASA's budget is less than one half of 1% of the nation's budget. Last that calculated out to about $58 per American. You spend that filling the tank of your car. So we're asking Americans to give one tank of gas for their space program. How much of that other 99.5% of the budget is spent on stuff that's looking 10, 20 you know, years down the road, planetary defense, a place to go in, you know, when Earth becomes you know, perhaps overpopulated uh, or we just need to go somewhere else? Not much. And so you know, one tank of gas per American, and look at what we're doing, Imagine if we had two tanks of gas in our <laughs> space program, what we could be doing, you know, right now. Thank you so much, sir. Hey, thanks for being the first to ask the question, too. Appreciate that. Good afternoon. Uh, so I have a two-part question. The first is what kind of timeline is NASA looking at for the implementation of nuclear propulsion in space? And the second is I've got friends that are submariners, and they've been talking about NASA going more towards them because they are more used to confined Radiation. space. Radiation. <laughs> I'm <used> to radiation. 
uh, more used to confined spaces for longer periods of time, and if that's the case, how do we as aviators stay relevant in space exploration? Um, maybe, maybe I'll start that. Right now we're developing, uh, we, we hit pretty hard, uh, nuclear propulsion. We are the wrong three to ask about that. One big problem with launching nuclear propulsion into space is if you have an anomaly on liftoff. So you you know that is a that is a huge concern. But we are there is a uh, there is a propulsion system that they're working on. I think what you're going to see more though is energy sources for Moon and Mars using uh, some sort of nuclear power for that sort of stuff. Uh, does anybody have a better answer? Yeah, I mean, it actually was up at Langley and, and talked to a guy from Glenn Research Center who worked on the original ones. The last time we had a nuclear uh, power source launch was 1965. And so to be able to go to the moon, you know, we're, we're looking to be, you know, south pole where we should have sunlight pretty much 99% of the time, but it's a low grazing angle. We should be able to get solar energy. But if we want to go to the dark side or we want to be able to have rovers that can do long treks or things like that, perhaps the nuclear, you know, isotope, radio, radioactive isotopic generators, you know, would be really helpful. Uh, and certainly on our Mars class vehicle, we're going to need that as well. Uh, and so it is just that launch uh, part that is our issue and have we you know gotten over our hysteria uh, the fact that rockets blow up all the time now that we've proven for several decades that we don't launch vehicles off of uh, you know the Kennedy Space Center that we do that and so it's a very intelligent very economic uh, space and weight wise and can give us the power we need without carrying all the chemical propellants to generate the power. And then the second half of your question was how do we maintain relevancy of the aviator at NASA and in the astronaut program that is a no-brainer right now, so let me set your mind at ease. We are getting ready later this year or early next year to launch the first test crew on SpaceX in a Dragon and the first test crew on Boeing in a CST-100. Um, we've assigned eight people to those missions. Every single one of them is a test pilot or flight test engineer from either the Air Force, the Navy, or the uh, uh, Marine Corps. Um, and then in the entire astronaut office, we have 38 active astronauts right now. We have two submariners and we have two Navy SEALs and the rest are in the medical profession, pilots, et cetera. So, um, you know, of the eight that are assigned, the three of us are sitting up here not assigned. We have a bunch of others. So the, the bulk of our organization still comes from that test aviation background. We're always going to be building new hardware. We're always going to be testing new systems. And that background is always going to be important. I would say it's a lot easier to take a naval aviator, turn him into a space scientist or a space plumber or a space medical doctor than it is to take a research scientist and turn them into an operator. And, and I told you guys, so I'm still in the two, two years of initial training, but, and they had initially said during that, those two years, that's all you're focused on, you're not going to do anything else, but um, because we're in need of people with that aviation background and test pilot background, I've already been evaluating displays for Orion, I've already been evaluating the cockpit, I've been working on procedures for the new Boeing spacecraft, so that background is absolutely Wait, needed. You were at Langley yesterday flying a lunar I lander simulator, Langley, Jaws. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. So Plenty of work to be done. Still needed. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm curious what, in addition to your TPS or Top Gun experience, uh, from a command perspective, what do you think has been some of the most valuable experience that has translated to being an astronaut? Yeah, so I think going back to, so right before, um, I came out, I think I told you guys, I was the quality assurance officer um, out in Yuma. So I had a lot of the maintenance department uh, working for me. And we've talked about it a lot, but those, the skills of being able to, to lead other people and being able to work with other people and have people um, respect you, not, be, not because you're in a position of leadership, but because they view you and respect you as a leader are all very important. Um, if, if you go through a six-month deployment in a six-person stateroom and you do not end up taped to your ceiling, you probably have developed the skills that you need to survive in this place. Um, another one that just comes to mind, and I don't want to push test pilot school because you've got to want to go there. It is not a fun experience. But the, and just in the military in general, you're going to learn to process. Have you flown in a T6 yet? No, sir. Okay. You're going to learn to process a thousand different inputs at once. That is a critical skill. Being able to separate the things that matter and the things that don't matter at this moment in time but are going to matter in five minutes or ten minutes or tomorrow, those sorts of skills really, really pay off. And in test pilot school, the, their whole purpose is to throw a thousand times the amount of work at you that you can possibly do in a given day or week. And so all they're trying to do is get you to just process as much information as you possibly can fast and be able to separate the important stuff from the non-important stuff because that's a critical skill. And you're going to get that in whatever aircraft you fly, uh, wherever you go. 
and, and survive the six-person stateroom. And one particular skill that, that, that I started here that was for me really important was, you know, I, I came, you know, did the, the basic school, I did infantry officer's course, I came down here wanting to be a pilot, but also back in my mind was, what if I suck? You know, <laughs> what, what if I, I stink at flying and, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave. And so it was really important to me, every flight not only to prepare for it, but I have always taken notes. When I come back to a debrief, taking the discipline and the time to sit down and really analyze the work you did and being very self-critical about what you did right and what you did wrong and writing that stuff down uh, or capture it however you know, works for you, but so that you can make sure you do the things you did well again. But for me, it's not making the same mistake twice. Because you know, the mistakes that you live from, you, know, you don't want to make those again because they may turn into the ones where you don't live from. And so even today, you know, to this date, when I fly an airplane, there's something I learn, and I'll write that down in my logbook. And when I you know, do flights or training, I write that stuff down so I can not only review that before my next event, I can make sure that never do the same thing twice. Thank you. I think one other thing to add to that is also just the versatility. So in the Marine Corps, every time I thought I'd figured out a job or finally had the hang of it, guess what? I was rotated to a new job. And we get used to that as military members, whereas um, you know, people in the civilian sector don't necessarily do that. They become expert at a field and excel at that field. But we're constantly rotating what job we're doing, who we're in charge of, um, all that stuff. And I, I talked a lot about the versatility of the things we need to learn to, to go to space. And so that's definitely carried over. Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, I've read a little bit about orbital debris, and there's obviously been movies made about it. And I just would wonder, from the perspective of an astronaut in the actual community, is that something that's an actual safety concern? Um, or does it have any bearing on the future of spaceflight? Certainly, absolutely. So I, I went to bed one night and uh, on the space station, and those cupola windows looked good. And I came down to the cupola window the next morning, and there was like a dime-sized chip out the on the front side of it. Uh, when you go out on a spacewalk on the space station, there are little dents and dings and holes all over the exterior of that stuff. So that stuff is everywhere. Um, we fly the space station at 250 miles up, which is not that high. There's still a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of atmospheric drag up there. So any of those particles in that area slowly are going to decelerate and come back down. The scary part is where uh, the U.S., Soviet Union used to blow up satellites long ago, and now we have some countries that are getting uh, aggressive and trying to do that sort of stuff and are succeeding. And you blow something up about four or five, 600 miles up there, and now you, you become a huge threat because those particles, they're not going to deorbit. They're way outside the atmosphere and they're going to be stuck up there forever. And now, like Randy was saying, we're getting ready to launch Orion on an EM-1 mission, and that thing is going to do a high orbit around the Earth. The number one safety factor for that mission, number one, of all that fuel being expended and going out to the moon and everything, the number one risk to human is orbital debris. So it is, it is certainly a huge risk. We have to move the space station all the time uh, to, to avoid that stuff. So we track big enough pieces of debris and small enough pieces of debris, just whack into that thing, and we have safety systems designed. So um, I don't think anybody in the audience needs to care about it, but we certainly care about it. Thank you very much. Great question. Hello, everyone. Don't worry, I'm not carrying anything explosive unless its ratings go sky high. I'm Emmett Michael Smith, science fiction writer, awesome. and this is my first book, The Shadow of Olympus. It's about the first human colony on Mars. I spent four years researching it, writing, rewriting, and re-rewriting until I, it said what I wanted it to say, and I'm working on the first two sequels now. I brought a copy for each of our four speakers up here, if I may give them to them. And think, then if you decide you like it enough, you could uh, really enjoy your endorsement. Well, you know, we're government employees, so you're not going to get that. Yeah. Well, but we would love to read it. It's a nice try, though. <laughs> well, uh, it, it's free. <laughs> I'm not bribing anybody. Uh, my, my only question to you is, does the colony survive? Or do I have to wait for the oh, sequel? Yes. Uh, All right, good. Although uh, there is a war that starts on Earth and then spreads into space, and it requires all the ingenuity the colonists have to keep their colony alive. Outstanding. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. But it's called The Shadow of Olympus. You can find it on all the all online book sites. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Or at Halsey's Book Index here in Pensacola. All right, outstanding. Thanks for doing that. Good afternoon. With all the talk about um, space, uh, space vehicles becoming commercialized, do you see the astronaut business becoming commercialized and being less government-run and more 
SpaceX hiring one of you, for instance, out to be an astronaut specifically for SpaceX or one of the other companies? That's happening right now. Yeah. You know, on the uh, Boeing Starliner, for the very first flight of it, we have uh, Lieutenant Colonel Duke Mann, uh, the first Marine uh, female astronaut, uh, Jaws is number two. Um, we have uh, Colonel Mike Fink, U.S. Air Force retired flight test engineer, and we have uh, you know retired Captain Chris Ferguson um, flying on that. Chris is now a Boeing employee. He will be a you know, commercial astronaut going up there. They are working on the rule. You know, we've got uh, trying to commercialize ISS, like I mentioned, where you know the Boeing company can rent out a, a floor and Ariane can rent out a floor. Well, they're going to send people up for their commercial ventures. Well, they'll be commercial astronauts. And so, how do you adjust the crew code of conduct? to get government employees who have to sign up and take the oath, how do you get them to abide by the same rules that are necessary to make this, you know, the whole space station and spaceship function? And so these are all questions that are being answered right now because that's the big growth part, and that's the business case for all these companies to be able to get people up there who are not professional astronauts. And I, I always want to throw out when I hear this question, when I first got to NASA, I was like, I made it. Now I want no one else to ever make it, right? I mean, you want to be that person. You want to be at the front. You want to be doing it all. That is, it's a completely wrong outlook. Like this would be the greatest thing, right? If, if the commercial industry is taken off and we're getting to orbit so cheaply and, and they're profiting from that, that we can take this half of the room and send everybody up there and you could be military, you don't need to be, it doesn't matter. I mean, that's the best thing. As soon as the main engine's cut off and I look outside at the earth, the thing I thought was, I want every single person to do this. You know, I, I want $20 million. To me, that seems reasonable to pay. You can ride with the Russians. You know, that's obviously not for us, but for some rich people. And so I think don't look at that as a bad thing. Look at that as the absolute best course of action that could possibly happen for our civilization. I think that would be outstanding. Thank you. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, my question is, what is the Navy and Marine Corps' uh, stake in space right now? Why are they sending specifically military to space, and where does the Marine Corps and the Navy fit in the big picture of space in general? NASA wants us. That's pretty much, that's pretty much the big picture. And certainly, it's, it's a great question. Yeah, I mean, certainly Space Force is something that is being set up not because we are trying to militarize space. It's just we're behind other countries and we are, you know, standing up the capability to make sure that we do not get left behind. And so we don't know what that flavor that's going to be like. We don't know what that's going to entail. Uh, but certainly people who have been used to um, defending their country and training themselves in the disciplines required to do so might be useful for that particular, um, you know, department, I think it's a proper word for it, that we, if we end up with that. And so um, the Navy and Marine Corps certainly has led, whether it's you know, in uniform or out of uniform, in space for the entire time we've been doing it. There's been a Marine in every single astronaut class save one. And when I started at NASA, almost every single uh, company, the United Space Alliance, Boeing, Lockheed, they all had Marines running their departments for space because Marines are pretty good at that type of stuff. And so um, I think the, the, the skills that you learn here as a naval aviator and the disciplines are certainly stuff that's going to continue because it's been in our, our history so far, and I don't see that you know, waning at all. Thank you. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, my question is, with SpaceX plan to go to Mars in the very near future, how does that affect uh, NASA's plan to go to the, the Moon to Mars mission? It, it's right in line with it. Uh, we, we just put out uh, a request for lunar landers. Uh, I think it went out yesterday. And we certainly hope that SpaceX submits. Um, we want to use those companies. We want to leverage their novel ideas for certain um, they want to put uh, Red Dragon down on, on Mars. They cer certainly delayed those plans a little bit right now to focus closer at home with Falcon Heavy and uh, some of the other programs that they have running and uh, BFR. So, uh, man, more power to all those people. I, that is just absolutely outstanding. That stuff is incredible. And when we go to the moon in 2024, uh, the three of us are sitting in meeting. We were, we were actually this morning sitting at the golf shack eating breakfast and listening to an all hands with the guy who's leading that. It's not NASA building a lunar lander. It's us asking 
companies, commercial companies in the U.S. How, hey, we want to go to the moon in 2024. What can you guys bring to us? Last night at the social, I was talking to an old admiral that I no, a young admiral that I knew, uh, Killer, and he, he was saying, hey, there's a company in Finland that's doing this uh, AK training with these goggles, and you guys need to check them out. And I was like, that is exactly what we need to train. We don't need this huge simulator that takes up this whole building to learn how to land on the moon. We need that system that cost eight grand. So all that stuff is fantastic. And the only thing I'd suggest is if you're going to book a ticket to Mars, book it on the company that has the round trip ticket. <laughs> Depending on your <laughs> on your desires. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, so space has kind of been this uh, theater of diplomacy between countries who um, have been competing with each other. But as uh, space travel becomes more commonplace, it becomes more. Uh, you have more. Uh, private interests in space, do you foresee that um, we might get more conflicts in space? Is that possible? Uh, like armed conflict, I mean. Okay, wherever people go, there's going to be fights, right? Um, so I think that it's, it's inevitable. If we look out with a 500-year lens, inevitable. Uh, right now, I think that two people holding laser beams shooting them at each other seems a little laughable. Um, I don't think we're going to be there in the near term. Uh, but I will tell you right now that the luxury and now we're getting the military side. Uh, this is not a NASA answer. So the luxury that, that we as Americans have, have had for the last 50 or 60 years of basically uh, absolute dominance in low, medium, and high Earth orbit uh, is gone. Those days are definitely behind us. And anti-satellite missiles going up and goofing around with people's satellites in orbit, that stuff is real. It's happening. And uh, we really need to start thinking of a way to defend ourselves on that. Uh, if you take down the GPS network, you've taken down not just your iPhone, you've taken down the U.S. banking system, the global banking system. Everything is time synchronized off of GPS. Um, is certainly time, a bit parochial, but it's certainly time for us to start defending uh, those assets that we put in space. Thank you. Lieutenant, you get the last question. <laughs> Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, my question is, if you were uh, back in my shoes, second lieutenant or ensign, um, what, uh, first of all, did you always want to go NASA? And second of all, uh, what kind of schools or jobs would you seek in order to get where you are today? I think we can all take a hack at that. You want to start? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, sure. So first, did I always want to join NASA? Pretty much yes. From sixth grade, I decided I wanted to be an astronaut, and it never really changed. That being said, it was not always at the forefront of my mind. You know, when I was flying Cobras in Afghanistan, I wasn't thinking about becoming an astronaut. And I don't know that if you asked me to leave to become an astronaut in that moment that I would have said yes. Um, but it has been a dream of mine for a long time. Um, in terms of you know schooling and things to get here so actually when i was here waiting to to start up flight school waiting to class up a bunch of marines and i went over to cape canaveral and we watched a shuttle launch and i had joined the military thinking i wanted to fly jets but after going through the basic school and flying in frogs and in 53s and learning about the cobra yet <laughs> um, I, I remember the first time I saw a cobra and I, one of my good friends, his father flew cobras and so he'd always talk about them and the first time I saw one I was like, I want, I want to fly that aircraft. And there was a little part of me that was torn because I thought you needed to be a jet pilot to be an astronaut. I was like, well, do I just let go of that dream and, and go for this aircraft that I really want to fly? And when I went to see that shuttle launch, it was STS-116, and Sonny Williams was launching on it. And for those of you who don't know Sonny Williams, uh, naval helicopter pilot. And so when I read her bio and found out she was a helicopter pilot, I was like, score. Oh, great. I can, <laughs> I can do this thing that I really want to do, fly these helicopters and still have a chance and not shut that door for NASA. And so my biggest advice would be don't, don't pick a school or pick a platform or pick these things just because, you know, you, you maybe want to be an astronaut one day. Do what it is you want to do. And, and that's probably the best way, I think, to, to end up here. Because I don't think I'd be here if I flew jets. I love flying helicopters. I absolutely love flying helicopters. Is someone laughing at this? <laughs> <laughs> and 
And I don't think I'd be here if I didn't fly Cobras because I had a passion for flying Cobras. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. And what she didn't tell you was that you know, her class are over 18,000 people that applied and we picked 12. And so the odds of getting picked are slim and none. And for every person that is up here on the stage, there were a whole bunch more well-qualified people just for, for the grace of God, we got picked. Luck. And so it can't be something that you want to do your whole life and your whole life is focused on that and you are not a well-balanced person that you've, you know, uh, stab people in the back to try and get where you're going, you know, and that kind of stuff. You need to be a good, you know, well-rounded person. We've got, you know, classical pianists. We've got people who climb out, you know, Everest. We've got a wide variety of folks that have, like, like Josh was saying, passionate in what they were doing and very good at it. And so we don't need you guys to think, oh, well, I want to be an astronaut someday. I think that's fascinating. And go, okay, I'm going to go to my first squadron teleskipper. I'm going to be an astronaut. And I want to go to Top Gun. I want to go do this just because I'm going to be an astronaut. No, we need you to be the best, you know, lieutenant or captain in your squadron, the most tactically proficient, the safest ones out there to execute this particular mission. And by doing that and excelling in your military field and in your aircraft, that's what's going to give you the skills and the education, and the leadership, and the training that is the stuff that we eventually want to have in our space program. Awesome. Uh, I really can't say it any better. Uh, I grew up, I will tell, let you in a little secret just for those people right there in the back. I grew up watching A-10s fly over my house going into Martin in Maryland, and I wanted to go into the Air Force. That was all I wanted. I had pictures of F-16s and F-15s all over my wall. I didn't necessarily think about the Navy. And then I was out in San Diego hanging out on the beach, and these two Hornets went over. And I thought in my head, like, yeah, that's, that's, that's. so I, I see these guys go overhead, these, these two hornets, and I thought, oh my gosh, they're going to a ship. That is exactly what I want to do. That was like the moment in my life that it all connected for me. And, and he set his sights low and ended up flying Tomcats. So Yeah, yeah. I did fly Tomcats for a little while, but that was a cool machine too. So, uh, you know, that you, you're going to see those moments in your life that pop in and they're there for a reason and you, you follow that dream and just, and then crush the program and, uh. And it, it should be a, it should be a total, you guys are getting ready to embark on the coolest adventure uh, known to humankind. I think it's going to be a blast. I guess we could pull back up the slides, please. Thank Thanks you for, for the being question. here. Thank you. All right, like right now, just before we uh, let you go, is is what we're going to do is um, we've got a, one of these pictures that um, was signed by the, some of the Naval and Marine Corps aviators uh, down at NASA, and I'd like to present that to Searles here for the museum for your for your collection. And, and the museum will have electronic copies if you guys want to talk to Stirls and, uh, and get, it, get one for yourself. Also have a, um, an American flag that um, flew up in space. And it got about uh, 2,224 2, orbits or flew for about 58 million miles around the planet. And so we'd like to give that to the museum as well as a token of our appreciation. Come on back. we got to get right. some more pictures. That's good. Thank, Randy, thank you very much, comrade. All right, Colonel Johnson, if you want to come on up, please. We, uh, you know, a couple years ago was here and had a chance to uh, talk at the Marine Corps Ball. At that point, uh, Matzik 21 gave us a patch. That patch is back. It also has about 58,835,163 uh, miles on it. And we'd like to give that back to the Matzig for your uh, pr appreciation for all you're doing for all the lieutenants and make, getting them through flight school and getting them out to the fleet. So one of what I think is one of the uh, most sexiest yeah. pictures in the world. Um, <laughs> See how this propaganda works for the Marine Corps while we yeah, always get our guys? So we've got uh, that picture signed by three of our Marine Corps astronauts. And uh, what I didn't mention on that, that other picture, we had the astronauts put the month and the year that they got their wings. And so we've got a copy of that for the Matt Sig. As you can see, I mean, that's the whole planet. You know, that's in that fish eye view. And Marine Corps, we, we serve in every climb in place, and, and there's a memento of that. And Stirls, for, of course, the, this is the Naval Aviation, you know, Marine Corps. So we have a copy for you guys as well. Perfect. Thank you very much. You're kind. Wow.
Nice work, Red. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you would agree with me that NASA is in very good naval aviation hands with these three phenomenal panelists. It is impressive to watch you guys talk and the enthusiasm by which all three of you approach your vocation pays us naval aviators great, great honor. Yeah. Jaws, Comrade, Tonto, we wish you well and safe travels and flying. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a round of applause for these. American Patriots. <laughs>